we are in Chapter 8, Hypothesis Testing, 8.1, Basics of Hypothesis. And a hypothesis is a claim or a statement about a property of a population. Hypothesis test, or a test of significance, is a procedure for testing a claim about the property of a population. Steps for hypothesis testing. First thing we're going to do is make a statement regarding the nature of the population. Second, we're going to collect evidence, sample data, to test the statement. And third, we're going to analyze the data to answer the plausibility of the statement. The next two definitions are ones that we're going to be using from now until the rest of the semester. So we have null and alternative hypotheses. So our null hypothesis is denoted H not is a statement to be tested. It is a statement that is assumed true until evidence indicates otherwise. Alternative hypothesis, denoted H1, is the hypothesis that sam sample observations are influenced by. This is some non-random case. So our null hypothesis is also our default, and we denote that by H0. And our default is what we currently accept. So this is what we currently accept um, for our parameter, whatever parameter is that we're talking about. H1, our alternative hypotheses, this is what you're trying to test. So this is what you are testing is going to be what we talk about in our alternative hypothesis. So what you are testing. For example, suppose we wanted to determine whether a coin was fair and balanced. A null hypothesis miss, might be that the half the flips would result in heads and half would result in tails. An alternative hypothesis would be that maybe the number of heads would be different. Symbolically, these hypotheses would be expressed as... So first thing is, a couple things to note on here. We have a P here, and that P is standing for proportions, and that's the parameter for this example, but it could be P, it could be mu, it could be sigma, or it could be sigma squared. And then we have our H0 and our H1 with our null and our alternative. We have an equal sign always for our null. And then we have three different symbols here. No, you do not write all three. You're going to select one. And again, it depends on the problem that you're dealing with. So only select one. The other thing I want you to notice is that this number is the same in the null and is in the alternative hypotheses. And so there's three ways to set up a null and an alternative hypothesis. We have one, the equal hypothesis versus the not equal hypothesis. This is called a two-tailed test. We have two, which is going to be where we have equal versus less than, which is our left-tailed test. Three, which is going to be equal versus greater than, which is a right-tailed test. Again, it depends on what the problem is asking for and what you are testing in your alternative hypothesis. So a two-tailed test, we have our normal distribution. Two tail to be shading in each of those little tails. Whereas if we had a left tail test, that little shaded area would only be in our left tail. And then a right tail test, we have our normal curve and that little area would only be on the right tail. The other thing I want you guys to notice is that for all of these we have our null and alternative hypotheses. And I want you to look at all of the nulls. All of the nulls are exactly the same. They all say H0 is going to be the parameter. Again, either P, mu, sigma, or sigma squared, depending on the problem, equals some value, some number. And then your alternative hypothesis, H1, is going to be parameter. Whatever that parameter is, it's going to be the same thing. And either not equal to for a two-tail test, less than for a left-tail test, greater than for a right-tail test, and then some value. So the first example on here says the null and alternative hypotheses are given. Determine whether the hypothesis test is left-tailed, right-tailed, or two-tailed, and what parameter is being tested. So the first one on here that we have has a less than symbol in here, and that means that because we have a less than, this is going to be a left-tailed. 
tail test. And the parameter that we're using, if you look at, we have a P. And those P's stand for a proportion. So this is going to be a proportion. And that is our parameter. The second one we have is a greater than symbol here. So this is a right-tailed test. And then we have sigma in here. If you remember, sigma stands for standard deviation. And that is the parameter that we are testing. The example on the next page says determine the null and alternative hypotheses. So the first example, A, says according to the National Association of Home Builders, the mean price of an existing single family home in 2009 was 218600 A real estate broker believes that because of the recent credit crunch, the mean price has decreased since then. So a few things to notice with this is that it does say we're talking about the mean price. And then it also says that they are testing to see if it decreased. That's what this person believes. So we're going to go ahead and write H0 and H1. And again, we have our parameter that we are using is mu. So put a mu. Your null always gets an equal sign for this type of test. And so we have an equal sign, and the amount that it is equal to is from the 2009 value of 218,600. And now because this, this real estate broker believes that it has decreased, that means that we are going to put a symbol of less than, meaning decreased, and that same value would go here that we had in our null hypothesis. So this is our null and alternative hypotheses for this problem. So let's go ahead and look at B. So B says in 2010, the standard deviation SAT score on the critical reading test for all students taking the exam was 112. A teacher believes that due to changes in high school curricula, the standard deviation of the critical reading scores is different than 2010. So different the keyword in here and then it's also talking about the standard deviation. So writing our null and our alternative hypotheses. It does say standard deviation which is sigma so I'm going to go ahead and write a sigma in here for both of these. Our null is always equal to and the value that we're talking about here is that the standard deviation is equal to 112. It does say different and different is an interesting word Different doesn't mean that it's larger than or smaller than. It means that it's just not the same. So we're going to go ahead and use a not equals to. And again, that same number there, 112. So again, this is our null and alternative hypotheses for part B. The next thing that we have is four outcomes from a hypothesis test. So one is you can reject your null hypothesis when the alternative hypothesis is true. And this decision is true. Two. Do not reject the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is true. This decision would also be correct. And then we have three and four, which results in some kind of error. So three says we're going to reject our null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is true. This decision is incorrect, and this type of error is called a type one error. Number four says do not reject the null hypothesis when the alternative hypothesis is true. This decision would also be incorrect, and this type of error is called a type 2 error. What is written up above is also written in this table here for you guys to look at. This process, though, that we're talking about can be compared to court trials. A person comes into court charged with a crime. A jury must decide whether the person is innocent, which is our null hypothesis, or guilty, which is our alternative hypothesis. Even though the person is charged with a crime at the beginning of the trial and until the jury declares otherwise, the accused is assumed to be innocent. Only if overwhelming evidence of the person's guilt can be shown is the jury expected to declare the person guilty. Otherwise, the person is considered innocent. 
In a jury trial, there are two types of errors. So one, which is our type one error, right here, so type one, the person is innocent, but the jury finds the person guilty. And then type two, which is our type two error that we would have, is the person is guilty, but the jury declares the person to be innocent. These two errors, along with the correct decisions, are shown in the table below, where the jury decision is shown in bold on the left margin, and the true state of affairs is shown in bold along the top margin of the table. So take a second to kind of read back through this and kind of get an understanding of what type 1 error is and what type 2 error is. So the next thing we have is the probability of making a type 1 error or a type 2 error. What we have is alpha and beta. So alpha is the probability of a type 1 error, the probability of rejecting H0 when H0 is true. And then we have beta, which is the probability of a type 2 error, which is the probability of not rejecting H0 when H1, H1 is true. Or you can also think of it as saying as H0 is false. So look at the next example. It says, according to the National Association of Home Builders, the mean price of an existing single-family home in 2009 was $218,600. A real estate broker believes that because of the recent credit crunch, the mean price has decreased since then. From a previous example, we determined what the null and alternative hypotheses are. And so we have part A and part B, which is about the explaining what it is to make a type 1 error for part A and then explaining what it is to make a type two error. So first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and write down our null and alternative hypotheses that we had from the previous problem. And so we had our null was gonna be that the mean is equal to 218,600. And then H1, which is our alternative, is gonna be the mean is less than 218,600. And so to make a type one error, that is where we reject H0 when H0 is true. So we're going to reject H0 when H0 is true. So for this problem that we have, that means that we are going to reject H0, and our H0 is going to be that the mean is equal to 218,600 when that is true. So when mu equals 218,600 is true. So from here we need to write this. This was kind of an outline to kind of take the definition and our null and kind of put that together and then we're going to explain what it is a little bit clearer but kind of using what we have written over on the left side. So taking what we did over on the left and writing down our null and alternative hypotheses, the definition of what it is to make a type 1 error and kind of referring to that with the problem that we have, we can explain it and say that the sample evidence led the real estate broker to conclude that the mean price of an existing single family home has decreased when in fact it has not decreased. So let's go ahead and look at those words that I have underlined, and we have decreased and not decreased. I want you guys to realize that we always discuss what it is in regards to our alternative hypothesis. So let's look at our type 2 error. So again, a type 2 error is going to be we do not Reject H0 when, when H0 is false. So when H0 is false. And so for this problem, this would be we do not reject. So do not reject our 
H naught value, which is that mu is equal to 218,600. When our mean is equal to 218,600 is false, which would mean that mu is less than the 218,600 is true. So we're going to take what we have here and we are going to explain what it is to make a type 2 error. So from what we had, which is writing down what the type 2 error is and how it pertains to this problem, we can explain it and say that the sample evidence did not lead the real estate broker to conclude that the mean price of an existing single family home decreased when in fact the mean price did decrease. Again, noticing that we use that word decreased in there. So the next thing that we have is the level of significance is a fixed probability of wrongly rejecting the null hypothesis if it is in fact true. This is the probability of making a type one error, which is also called alpha that we saw earlier. It is the probability of a type one error and is set by the investigator in relation to the consequence of such an error. That is, we want to make the significance level as small as possible in order to protect the null hypothesis and to prevent, as far as possible, the investigator from an inadvertently making a false claim. The significance level is usually denoted by alpha. Significance level is equal to the probability of a type 1 error, which is alpha. And usually the significance level is chosen to be a decimal such as 0 0.05 or equivalent to 5%. An inverse relationship exists between alpha and beta, meaning as the probability of a type 1 error increases, the probability of a type 2 error is going to decrease and vice versa. The next thing we're going to talk about is stating conclusions for hypothesis testing. So once a decision whether or not to reject the null hypothesis is made, the researcher must state his or her conclusion. Sample evidence can never prove the null hypothesis to be true, by not rejecting the null hypothesis, we are saying that the evidence indicates that the null hypothesis could be true. So we have the same problems that we saw earlier. And this says the null hypothesis for the problem is not rejected. And again, this is talking about the home builder problem that we had before. So I'm going to go ahead and state my conclusion based upon the results. And with that, I need to have my null and my alternative. So I'm going to go ahead and rewrite those down. We did that earlier in the notes. So H naught is going to be that mu is equal to 218,600. And our alternative, H1, is going to be that mu is less than 218,600. So for our conclusions, we're always going to start with there is sufficient or there is not sufficient evidence. And so we're going to start off with there is. And for this problem, since there, we did not reject our null hypothesis, that means there is not sufficient evidence. to conclude that the mean price, and we're going to talk about what our problem is talking about, which is the mean price of an existing single family home. has decreased, and again decreased is what we were testing, that's our H1, our alternative hypothesis, from the 2009 level of $218,600. So when we go through these problems, we're always going to be stating a conclusion. 
And again, what you're talking about in here is always going to be your alternative hypothesis, which is that it is less than, and I use the word decreased. You could have used less than. Different words you can use that mean the same thing. So there's two more problems on here that we will save and try to go through together with writing the conclusions to get used to the idea of that. The next thing that we have is the test statistic is a value of making a decision about the null hypothesis. It's found by converting the sample statistics such as p hat, x bar, or s to a score such as z, t, or chi squared with the assumption that the null hypothesis is true. So down below, we have a table here that has the different parameters that we use, which is going to be P for proportion, mu for mean, um, and those are the only two that we are using in order to do our continuing on with this with our problems. So we have your sampling distribution for proportion is going to be normal, and then for the mean, it's either going to be a T distribution or a normal distribution, depending on what you know. So the requirements are going to be for a proportion is going to be N times P and N times Q are going to be greater than or equal to 5. And we will get into this more. And then also for our mean, if we use a T distribution, we either sigma is not known and the distribution of the population is um, normally distributed, or sigma is not known and n is greater than 30. And then we're going to use a normal distribution if sigma is known and normally distributed population or sigma is known and we have a large sample size which is greater than 30. We have a critical region which is also called a rejection region and is an area corresponding to all values of the test statistic that cause us to reject the null hypothesis. There's three different methods in order to do testing. The first one that we have is called the traditional method. And then we have a second method, which is called the p-value method. And then we have a third method, which is our confidence interval method. So the traditional method that we have is going to be where, if you notice on the, on the graph there, we have a two-tailed, a left-tailed, and a right-tailed test. And we have our rejection regions, which is where we reject h naught. So those rejection regions are going to be the shaded part. So those two right here are going to be our rejection regions, our critical regions. And this is where you guys would reject H0. And again, this would be one over here. And then on the right tail, it's that right area. So find the critical value. So steps to do this is going to be to find the critical value that corresponds to the significance level. Second thing is going to be if the test statistic is in the critical or the rejection region, then you're going to reject your null hypothesis. So there's this is called the traditional method, and we will look at an example of this. Of this. The more commonly used method is going to be our p-value method. So what is a p-value? So definitely something you need to know. p-value is the probability of getting a value of a test statistic that is at least as extreme as the test statistic obtained from the sample data, assuming that the null is true. And then I put in parentheses here, um, more of like a explaining it a little bit more in just plain English and not so textbooky. So this is going to be the probability of what you observed occurring randomly if the null is true. So if you notice on here, we still have those rejection regions. So depending on if it's left-tailed, right-tailed, two-tailed, and so when we go through this, we're going to have to do a few things. The first thing that we're going to do is going to be we have to find our p-value. So the first thing that we're going to do is find our p-value. So find p-value. This is done on the calculator. So on calculator. Second thing that we are going to do is going to be if p, your p-value, is less than or equal to alpha. That means it is in the rejection region. That means that we are going to reject H naught. So then reject H naught. 
So then reject H naught. Otherwise, we do not reject H naught. The third method that we have is called the confidence interval method. And for the confidence interval method, if the confidence interval contains the population parameter, then we do not reject the null hypothesis. And if the confidence interval does not contain the population parameter, then we reject the null hypothesis. So this is our third method of testing. Again, that p-value method is going to be the one that we use mostly. So the p-value method, to use a p-value to make a conclusion in a hypothesis test, compare the p-value with alpha. So here's the two different scenarios that you would have. Either the p-value is going to be less than or equal to alpha, then we reject H0. And if the p-value is greater than alpha, then we do not reject H0. The p-value is the probability of getting a test statistic equal to or more extreme than the sample result. If the p-value is greater than the level of confidence, then we can say that the probability of a more extreme test statistic is larger than the level of confidence, and thus we do not reject H0. If, on the other hand, the p-value is less than the level of confidence, we conclude that the probability of a more extreme test statistic is smaller than the level of confidence, and thus we reject H0. So the example on the next page says, suppose we are testing the hypothesis H0, which is p is equal to 0.3, versus H1, which is p is greater than 0.3, so this is a right tail test, and we find that the p-value is equal to 0.23. Let alpha equal 0.10. Explain what this means, and would you reject the null hypothesis and why? So the first thing is, what does this mean? And then we'll talk about, does, do we reject our null hypothesis and why? So first off, if the p-value is equal to 0 0.23, we would expect results at least as extreme So at least as extreme as the test statistic in about 23% of the samples. If the null is true. So this is what that p-value means. The second thing was asking, would you reject the null hypothesis and why? So second part here, since the p-value is equal to 0 0.23, which is greater than alpha, which was 0 0.10, this means that we do not reject H0. It does ask for Y. And so a reason you guys can say is that the p-value is larger than alpha. So because the p-value is larger than alpha. And that's that p-value method that we were going to be using for the class. So the next example that we have says the test statistic of z equals 1 is obtained when testing the claim that p is greater than 0.3. Identify the hypothesis test as being two-tailed, left-tailed, or right-tailed. And so this is a, because it's greater than, this is going to be a right-tailed test. State the null and the alternative hypotheses for this problem. So your null and 
alternative. So H0 and H1 is always how we start these. The parameter that we're talking about here is a P, which stands for proportions. Remember, your null always has an equal sign. And if you notice, they gave us that P is greater than 0.3. And that right there is going to be our alternative. And so our null is going to be that it is equal to 0 0.3. Part C says to find the p-value. So I'm going to go ahead and sketch a standard normal distribution. The reason why we're sketching a standard normal distribution is because we have a z-value here. And so I'm going to go ahead and draw my standard normal distribution, which means that we have a mean at 0. And the value that we have here that we were given was z is equal to 1. And so this area over here that is shaded would be equivalent to finding our p-value. And so again, remember with the standard normal, you have mu is equal to 0 and sigma is equal to 1. And so in order to come up with that area there, which is going to be our p-value, we need to use normal CDF. And so we have to put in normal CDF our lower bound, which is 1, our upper bound, which is 1 E99, our mean and our standard deviation. With probabilities and p-values, we are going to round these four decimal places. So we get 0 0.1587. So this area here is equal to 0 0.1587. Next part on here says using the significance level of alpha equals 0.05, should we reject H0 or fail to reject H0? Use the p-value approach. So since our p-value we just found up above in part C is equal to 0 0.1587 and this is larger than alpha which is equal to 0 0.05. This means that we are going to not reject or fail to reject. So fail to reject H0. Another way to say this is do not reject H0. So part E says to find the critical values. And the critical values correspond to your alpha level. And the alpha that we have for this problem is going to be equal to 0 0.05. That was listed right up above. And so in order to find our critical value, I'm going to draw another standard normal distribution. And so centered again at 0 is our mean. And our z, and since it's a right tail test, I'm going to go down and put z over here on the right side. z is equal to, and to find that value that corresponds to, which is our critical value, our area over here to the right would be 0 0.05. So in order to find z, we are going to use inverse norm. So all these ideas that we had in previous chapters are getting used again. For inverse norm, it was area to the left, which is 0 0.95, the mean, which is 0, and the standard deviation, which is 1. Working this out, I'm going to go ahead and round three decimal places. I get a value of 1.645. So again, 1.645. And it says for F, it says using the significance level of alpha equals 0 0.05, should we reject or fail to reject the null and using the traditional method? So again, I'm going to sketch a standard normal distribution so we can see a little bit better on here what's going on. And then we'll talk about if we're going to reject or fail to reject. So again, here is our standard normal. The mean is going to be 0. We have a rejection region, which is determined by that critical value, which is where we have z is equal to 1.645 that we calculated right up above. And again, that shaded area that corresponds to this is equal to alpha, which is 0 0.05.
And so for this, and again, this is our rejection region or our critical region. So I'll put down rejection region. And again, that num number right here, the 1.645 is our critical value. So once you have this set up, which is what we did up above in part E, I need to take my test statistic, which was given to us at the very beginning of the example. It says the test statistic is Z equals one. So where would Z equal one go? And Z equals one is over here. So Z is equal to one. And this value right here, I'll put down as our test statistic. And that was given to you guys up above. So test statistic. And so this is our test statistic. And if you notice, it is not in the rejection region. And so the test statistic is not in the rejection region. And so that means that we will fail to reject H0. So again, test statistic. Is not in the rejection or the critical region. And because of that, that means that we are going to fail to reject H0, or we do not, another way to say it is do not reject H0. So if you look at the conclusion that we had here from the traditional method, and also what we got in part D, which is using the p-value method, you will notice that the conclusions are the same. However, the way to go about testing is done different. Most books gravitate to using the p-value approach because it's quicker. You have one calculation to do, which is the p-value, and comparing that to alpha. Instead um, of the traditional method, which requires you to calculate your critical value, and then usually your test statistic, you would have to calculate on your own. It wouldn't normally be given to you. And so the time to do this type of problem would take longer with that traditional method rather than that p-value method.